Okay, this morning we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, if you came in, you got this little blue card that says blueprints on it. So um, I just kind of want to draw your attention to this. That for the next four weeks, we're going to be kind of walking through this somewhat. And as a church, you know, especially just merging a couple of weeks ago, I mean, some of the things, the questions that we're asking ourselves and we're talking about, okay, well, what do we do? You know, like there's a lot of changes going on and happening all at once, and it can be overwhelming. And for sure, that is not our intention or design is to overwhelm anybody. And we just want to apologize to you um, ahead of time for just because of some of those things are crazy. We kind of want to explain a little bit why we do what we do. Where does this come from? And so I think for many churches all around, you know, you, you, they do different things. The, the culture in the church feels a certain way. And we want to talk about, like, why, why is that that way? And for some churches, it's kind of haphazard. Just kind of, what, well, it's whatever we want to do. Someone has an idea, let's try this, let's try this, let's just do it. And, uh, and while that is good, you know, to do something, we want to have intention and purpose behind everything that we do. And so as a church, this kind of frames what we're about as a church. So if you look on that diagram, in the very middle of that square is something that said, a word that says vision. Now, vision is a catchy buzzword in church today. It can mean all kinds of things. You know, we don't mean this in some catchy buzzword way, but in a biblical way. What does the Bible compel us as a church to be? And where, what direction should we be going in as a body of believers moving forward to what God has called us to do and to be? That's what vision is. And so to make that, to, to help us kind of figure out that picture, we have to frame it. Every picture has a frame. And if it's a nice picture, you have a nicer frame, right? Because you're that. You want to frame that with something that kind of holds the parameters in of what that picture is. So for us, vision is, basically it's what the body of Christ does following after what God has compelled us to do. So things like planting church, uh, helping churches be planted, like in Life Point Church in Farmington, um, partnering in our overseas Southeast Asia missions partnerships. All the things that we do are based on this, this vision here framed, wrapped around in this. And so we're going to be taking the next four weeks and specifically talking about our values. This is kind of like the temperature of the church. What, does, what is kind of like the, the vibe when you walk in the room? This is what compels us. And so you notice all around the room are these four posters talking about our values. Gospel-centered over here, sacrificial generosity over here, transparent lives over here, and multiply everything over here. These are kind of the, the temperature which we, which we want our church to be about, and we're starting with gospel-centered. Now, gospel-centered is kind of the keystone of the other four values, and this is something that comes not just from, again, just our, our good thinking one day, it comes from Scripture. This is where it all started <laughs> with all over the place, right? It's just the Bible is littered with references of the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, um, the, the, it says, You shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Now, as the, the, the writer Luke was writing about this particular phrase, he's talking about the disciples. They're going to be witnesses of something, something that happened, and they're going to be telling the ends of the earth about this thing that happened. This event changed the world, and that event is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That singular event changed the world. And from that point, you see the gospel spread, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then where to go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And still today, the gospel is still spreading to the uttermost parts of the earth. We see it going there, and we're testifying of the resurrected Christ. We believe that this Jesus who died didn't just stay dead in a tomb, but he really did come back alive, and he's not just some guy. We believe that he is the Son of God, fully man, fully God. And this is not just some fairy tale. It's not just some self-help book that we're going to help sell, you know, make a bunch of money off of. We believe this event is what single-handedly transforms who we are as believers. And it should impact not just signing a card and saying, I'm now a follower of Jesus, but it impacts who you are today. As a church, it impacts who we are today. This single keystone component, the gospel, is everything. It's absolutely everything. This isn't just a buzzword. Romans chapter 1, verse 16. There's so many places, so many references, and I'm not going to 
talk about every single place in the Bible that mentions the gospel because we'd be here all day long. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. That is, it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So what does it say? What is the power of God for salvation? It's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. And the gospel is not something you do. The gospel is something that has been done. Galatians chapter 1 talks about there's only one gospel. And if anyone preaches to you another gospel, and it says, not that there is another one, let him be accursed, even if it's an angel from heaven. So we see that in Galatians that there are a lot of false gospels of things that help to people think this is what the gospel is, and it's not. So what is this? What is the gospel? All right, that we are dead in our trespasses and sins, every person on this planet. God, in his love for us, instead of giving us his wrath, full punishment that we deserved, he sends his son Jesus, fully God, to be wrapped in humanity. And he lives a perfect, human, sinless life. The only person to ever do this on the planet. Nobody else has lived a perfect, sinless life. Only Christ. And he, he comes in as a, a full, fully human, right? This is not just, he's not only half human. It's not anything like that. He's fully human. He's fully God. And he grows as a little boy. And he becomes a, an adult. And he goes to a cross and is publicly humiliated. He's shamed. He's whipped. He's beaten. And more than that, he suffers the full wrath of God poured out upon him for you and for me so that we would not have to suffer that wrath. And he does that willingly, lovingly, out of his grace. And then he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my righteousness as a gift. It's a gift. Here you go. You can't earn it. You can't do enough good deeds to overcome your bad. It's not about trying to live our best life now. This is our, our righteous problem. We are unrighteous, and God says, I'm going to give you my righteousness through my son. Not only that, I'm going to make you a new creation. The old's passed away. All's become new. My spirit is going to dwell with you and lead you and guide you and convict you, and I'm going to make you one of my children. That is the gospel. That event, what Jesus did on the cross, and then he saves us and redeems us and then transforms us to live new lives. But the gospel is about something that's already been done. A couple of false gospels. A couple ones I'm going to mention. There's so many. I could, we could spend all day. I'm not going to spend the time to tell you all the false, false gospels. But here's just a couple in our culture today. One, I would say, is the moral gospel. This is one I think that, honestly, most people live by. If you're a religious person, you probably live with a moral gospel. Just religion. And there are people all across churches today, probably even here, who believe in a moral gospel. And they're, they're, they're like, you know what? I'm here to become a better person, be a good person. That's not a bad thing to want to be a better person. It's good. It's great. But Jesus didn't die just so that we can go, oh, yeah, it's that guy. I, wanna, I just want to do just what he does. It's not just that. So we think, uh, if I can just do enough good to outweigh all the bad that I've done, I'll be good. I'll get to heaven one day, and Jesus will look at me and say, good job, you did it. You hit that bar. The problem is, we don't even come close. But God's standard is perfection. Perfection. So as we try to live, and we try to do good things, and we think, oh, I'm doing all right. Like, we start comparing ourselves to other people. I'm better than that guy. I'm better than that guy. Okay, I'm not as good as him, but that's all right. You know, he's, he's like, you know, a owner of a nonprofit or something. That's a whole different thing. I'm a but that's all right. I'm good enough. We can never be good enough for God because his standard is perfection. So the gospel is that I'm just going to try to be a good person. Now, in the, the true gospel, we do want to live for Jesus, but it's based off a different motivation. It's because he is Jesus and he deserves it all. He's given us righteousness. He's made us holy. Now we are to live holy. We are to live righteous lives because of who he not because we're trying to earn something out of it. It's not a wage that we get. So there's a moral gospel. I'd say a second one is 
closely related to that, I put prosperity gospel. And prosperity gospel, if you try to do enough good deeds, God rewards you with financial well-being, good health, nice cars, nice house. It's, it's all more of a divine Santa Claus, really, the way that we see Jesus versus the Son of God, King of heaven, King of earth, I mean, all that he is. And that divine Santa Claus view of Jesus, we live with all the time. And if you want to know if you live with that view of Jesus as the divine Santa Claus, ask yourself, when suffering hits, what do you think? You think, oh, did I not live good enough, a good enough life? Was I bad? Did I, did I sin in some way in order to get this suffering? That's prosperity gospel, false gospel. And a third one, I think, which is prevalent in our society today is, I'd say, a tolerance gospel. Here's what I mean by that. God doesn't care what we do or don't do. Sin isn't really sin, or sin is subjective. So here's what culture today, especially very prevalent in America, we go, that thing, this is, can't be that bad. Because, you know, I love, I, I'm, I'm a good person. Sin can't be that bad. You know, the way that I, my body's my body. I can do with it whatever I want. Marriage isn't that, that important. You know, it's, it's whatever. You know, society determines what's good and what's bad. And God loves us, so he doesn't care. It's a tolerance gospel. In this view, God is, in your making, God is not God. You've made God to fit who you are instead of God being the God of heaven and earth. All three of those prevalent false gospels, I think, in our culture today, and if we're not careful, can really hurt us as a church and as a body. So if we miss the gospel and start focusing on the false gospels, we miss it all. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to look this morning into what is the gospel and how does it affect us as people. 1 Corinthians 1, and we're going to read verses 22 to chapter 2, verse 2. 22, it says, For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him... You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Chapter 2, verse 1. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, first section here, Paul's writing the, the, this uh, letter to the Corinthian church. And even in all of Paul's letters, and even in Peter's letters and some of the other apostles who wrote letters, they all kind of start in similar places. If you read Corinthians and then you read like Galatians, two different areas that Paul's writing letters to, two different churches, but he starts in the same place. He starts with the gospel. And there's a reason for that because the Corinthians were erring by more of a, probably more of the tolerance gospel. They're like, well, whatever we do, we can do. It's no big deal. Who are you to tell us what we can or can't do? And Paul starts with the gospel. Why? Because any error that, error that we go usually deviates from the way that we see the gospel. It's another counterfeit. Paul is writing to the Corinthians to make sure they start with the right foundation. In the Galatian church, Paul does the same thing. They were turning to legalism and turning to, to works-based salvation, saying you have to do this to be saved. Oh, make sure you're getting circumcised, make sure you're doing these works and make sure you're going over here and doing all these things to be saved. And Paul says, no, it's not about that. It's all about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection on the cross. That means everything. So the foundation is always the same. So when we look at this, we need to start with the gospel. First three verses, 22 to 25, we see the gospel is the hurdle. 
The gospel is the hurdle. Verse 22, it talks about Jews demanding signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to Gentiles. So what Jesus says, or Paul says here, the gospel is going to be a stumbling block. It's going to cause people a challenge and a hurdle to walk over. Now think about this for a second. Here's what we believe. We believe that there's this guy, fully man, fully God, only one, only person ever, because he's in this situation, and he dies on a cross for our sins. And he comes back alive again. And we base our life on this Right? That is everything is based, our faith is on this, the gospel. Paul says in Corinthians later on, if the resurrection didn't happen, this is all foolishness. There's no point in this. But there was a bunch of people who saw the resurrected Christ and they ate fish with him, they talked with him, they hung out with him, they believed that they saw him. Now this is the message in which we preach. And that we are sinners. We are dead in our trespasses and sin. If you want to know a very unpopular message in our culture today, tell people that they're a sinner. Nobody wants to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Like, wait, I'm a sinner? Yes, I'm a sinner. And nobody likes hearing that you're wrong. I hate hearing that I'm wrong. <laughs> I hate it. I'm just being honest, right? And you who are like, oh, no, I don't like, I don't mind hearing that. You're lying to me. You don't like that either. And if you're not sure, I'll ask your spouse and then really hear the truth of that, right? Get into some of those fights. You're like, no, this happened. No, this is what happened. I'm not saying we have any of those. In fact, me and Lindsay, we found out this early on in our marriage. You know, have you ever had those, like, most of the dumb, dumbest arguments turn out to be the biggest ones? I found a way to solve that. We make a bet with each other, and we we'll say, all right, I'll make a bet with you. If you're right, I'll buy you some ice cream. But if I'm right, you're going to scratch my back for like 10 minutes, okay? So that's what we're going to do. And uh, you know what? It has solved so many marriage problems because you realize like, oh man, I was wrong, I was wrong, I was wrong. And then you're careful to say things that, you know, that you're not so sure about because you're going to lose that bet. So there are things like that, that we, we think that we're right, but we're really, we're a lot more wrong than we think we are. Who thinks the best of you? It's probably yourself. It's yourself. You look in the mirror and you go, I'm not so bad. I'm, I'm good. I'm a good guy. We look at the standard of the Bible. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, If any man keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, is guilty of it all. So it's not just, you know, I didn't break all of them. I'm not a murderer. We always jump to that, right? Like, that just, oh, I'm not a murderer. Good job, you know? Like, I'm glad you're not a murderer. Thank you. You know, our society thanks you for that. But that, God's eyes, like, that's it. That's not it. He even, Jesus breaks it down even further for us because make sure we really know how bad off we are. He says, okay, you may have not killed anybody. Good job. But if you have hate in your heart, committed murder. He says, well, good job. You may not have committed adultery. But if you've had lust in your heart, you've committed adultery. Oh, man. Whoa, all these like righteous, self-righteous Pharisees are standing back looking in the mirror going, whoa, whoa, hey, don't be <laughs> saying that stuff towards me now. Because even in our mind, we're, we're bad off. Jews, again, they following the Old Testament law, many of them had built commentaries upon commentaries upon commentaries of the law so that they could follow the law to perfection. And many looked at themselves in the mirror and thought, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. The Greeks, they loved philosophy. They would sit and, and, and think about new philosophies all the time. Acts chapter 17, Paul goes into, into Athens, and he's, he's looking around, and he's like, oh, yeah, you've got this God over here, this God over here, this thing, this, this new belief. And they'd sit and listen. So that's why I think Paul loved talking to Greeks, because he had always had an open audience. They're always waiting to hear the next philosophy. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. I think it's very, maybe some way similar to our culture today. People are always open to hear the newest thing. I want to hear the newest philosophy. And I'm, I'm going to think that's, that's the new one. That's the one I'm going to follow. That's good. And, and for the Greeks, they wanted to hear new things because that's what they wanted to follow and what they wanted to wrap their minds around. I'm talking about a Jesus, this guy Jesus who died, and, and he's saying, I'm a sinner, and now I'm, the uh, only way I can be saved is his blood alone, and I have to trust in him completely. Like, no, I only trust my reason, my intellect, how smart I am. Again, 
God is not God. God is something, this statue they made, or this belief or idea in which they conceived of. And if your God is somebody in which you say, you're the only one who sees that God, he's not God. It's an idol, and it's a false God. God is objectively God. He's always been God. I've used this example before. You know, if someone said they knew my wife, Lindsay, he said, okay, tell me about Lindsay. Well, she's about six foot three. She's got blonde hair, blue eyes. I'm like, you don't know Lindsay. That is not her. So the same thing with God. When we make up stuff about God, that's not God. It's somebody else. God is just God. So it says in verse 24, But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The beauty of the gospel is God chooses to use what seems foolish to men in order to shame us and bring us low so that he can exalt himself. And this hurdle is a hurdle for most people. Again, the, the, the gospel is a hurdle to salvation. Now in that, I want to make sure that we're kind of clear on something too. The gospel is the hurdle, right? It's supposed to be the hurdle. It's going to be a challenge. But a lot of times for us as Christians, the gospel is not the hurdle. We never even get to the gospel. Ian e. Bounds um, had this awesome quote, and he says that for, and I'm going to butcher it here because I can't find it in my notes here, but he says that the gospel is, or the, let's see, the Bible, is, for, so no, Christians are the only Bible sinners read. Christians are the only Bible sinners read. And so in that, what he's saying is, before anybody gets to hear the gospel, they're looking at you to see if you actually believe or share this message of the gospel. So what are they reading? If they see your life, if they hear you speak, if they hear you talk, what comes out of your mouth? What comes out of your life? Is it a life that says, I believe absolutely that this guy Jesus is my king and my Lord and I'm willing to give my life for him? Or is he a self-help book? Because they'll see that in your life. They'll see what you're committed to and you're passionate for. Where do you spend your money? Where do you spend your time? What do you think about nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? What motivates you? Because you may be thinking, well, nobody can see that stuff. Nobody knows. That comes out. I love mountain biking. I love it. It's a fun hobby. I, I love doing it. I love riding it. I, I mean, I'll watch like YouTube videos. I'll look up new bikes that I will never buy because I can never afford. But I, I'm all the time looking at these things because it's a passion and a hobby of mine. What do I do? I'll get up early in the morning at 6 a.m. as soon as it's daylight to go ride because it's the only time I can squeeze in a, a bike ride. It's a passion that I enjoy. And my life reflects that. When we, if you say you love Jesus, if you say he's everything to you, does your life reflect that? And not in some fake way, right? Because we can all show up here on a Sunday and all make an attendance to be here, sit in a chair, make a good show of it, and everybody goes, oh, that's a good Christian. What do you do the other days of the week? How do you treat your spouse? How do you treat your kids? How do you treat your neighbor down the street? How do you act in your business dealings? All the things that we do, we should glorify and represent Jesus because he's everything to us. And if we're not, we're just faking it. It's not this gospel. It's one of those false gospels, which is our foundation. The gospel is the hurdle, right? And, and, and so when people see us and see what we're about, if we're not about the gospel, that's going to come out in our lives every day. People will see that and they'll know the truth of who you really, what you really believe. Think about this at home. My kids know what I love. My kids know, like going back to the mountain biking thing. My kids know I love mountain biking. They're like, Daddy, are you watching more mountain biking videos? And it could be anything, you know, because like, they know I love watching mountain biking. You can't hide it as well as you think you, you can. The gospel has got to be the hurdle. And so when we share the gospel, it can't be what politic whatever political party that we support 
But you, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm into politics. I love reading on it. I love studying it. I love watching the news, knowing what's going on in our country. But honestly, what political party you belong to is, shouldn't be the first thing that comes out of our mouth as a follower of Jesus. Because what happens is a world around us is going to think this is more important than following Christ. It's who you belong to politically. Sometimes as Christians, we get so wrapped up in so many other things instead of the things that we should be about, which is the gospel. And those other things, they take our minds and they take our hearts and our passion and they pull us away in, in front of what's most important, which should be the gospel. The gospel should be the hurdle, but oftentimes everything else is. Is the gospel the hurdle for you, for other people as you share that message? Secondly, when we look at the gospel as the lens, let's look at verse 26. He says, For consider your calling, brothers. So your calling, again, your calling. That We use that language a lot in Christian circles. If you're familiar with that, what's my calling? What, is, what am I called to do? Your calling is that God, Jesus calls us. He, he draws us to salvation. We've been called. And it's all Christ's work. It's all him. It's all him, his doing, what he's done. He's called us. And he says, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. So if you're not catching what Paul's doing here, he's basically insulting the Corinthian church. He says, hey guys, you may be thinking that God's using the A team. No, he chose to use the B team. Says, oh, by the way, all you guys that, you're not smart, you're kind of dumb. You're not very strong. None of you guys have very uh, noble parents kind of are just common people. Honestly, you really are. I'm just, let, let me just be honest with you. That's what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church. Right, this is not the Sesame Street gospel, right? You're good. You're good. You're great. You're awesome. You're so good. I want, I want to lift you up. You get a trophy for just being alive. That's not what he's talking about here. He says, no, God actually, he's saying, and I love Sesame Street, by the way, so if you get offended or upset with me, I love Sesame Street. My kids love it. It's great for reading and learning and all those things. But I'm just talking about this idea that tries to teach people that we're better than what we really are. We're not doing well. Romans chapter 3 says, None seek after God. None are good. As it is written, there are none righteous, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all bad off. Paul makes it very clear that we feel really bad about ourselves when we read Scripture. And we should, right? But what is it? the beauty of the story is that it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. It starts there, and then Jesus, God says, this is what I'm going to do. No matter all of that, I still love you. The world would say I shouldn't, but I love you. So much so that I send my only son to die for you to give his life up for you, to suffer for you because of this love for you. And what does he say further down? Verse 27, God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring nothing to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The reason why he chooses to use the B team, which by the way, we're all the B team, if you're not sure of that yet. The reason why he chooses to use us, the B team, because he doesn't want anybody to be able to say, hey, look what I did right here. I did it. It all points back to God. The Bible continually points back to God and how strong he is, how powerful, how righteous, how just, how loving, how gracious, how, how merciful, all Components of who God is brings us low so it exalts himself. If you go look back at some of these things on the, the measures down at the bottom, the measures are, these are things that our church should be about. Or the, you'll see in our church, if we're doing this correctly, things such as God-centered worship, even as uh, we sing on Sunday. And man, we have awesome music, and I am so thankful for it. I love it. I Man, it's a blessing every Sunday morning to be here. But it's not about the band, and the band would tell you this too. It's not about them. It all points back to God. All of it. So when we sing, we're singing to God. He is the audience. The audience is not us. We're not like, you know, like, okay, let me hear something that I can, I can hear and be entertained by this. 
So it's all about Jesus. We're singing together corporately to Jesus to glorify him in his name. These measures here are all based on what it means to be gospel-centered. So the gospel is the lens. And he says down in, in verse 30, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So who became to us wisdom from God, we who didn't have wisdom, who were dumb, he became to us wisdom. So he gives that as a gift. Righteousness. He gives us a right standing with God. He gives that as a gift. We didn't earn it. We didn't do anything good to deserve it. He gives it to us. Sanctification. He makes us holy. We can say with confidence, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you can say today, I am holy, I am righteous. And that's not an arrogant thing to say. It's a biblical thing to say. Because Jesus gave us that gift. In redemption. Redemption. And again, the name of the church, the reason why we love this name is because it's God is prim purchasing us. You make giving us a new life so that we can live for him. So that is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord again, so that we can boast in the Lord. So how does this affect us? How does the gospel being the lens, how does that affect the way that we see the world and change the way in which we live and operate and, and our being? Well, some simple things, going back to things like marriage. I know in marriage that a lot of times I'm a selfish jerk. I just am. I want to do things that I don't always think of my spouse first. In fact, most of the time I probably think of myself first. I don't always think of my kids first as a father. I think about myself. You know, it's hard to get up early in the morning and my kids get up because they are good at getting up early. I don't know, they don't even have an alarm clock, but they know how to get up early. And you're like, I want to sleep in 30 more minutes. I don't want to get up. And you get grumpy, and you lose your temper, and you lose your cool. That's just me being honest as a father. It's hard. It's hard. I don't always want to help somebody down the street, you know, with something going on, because I got things to do. But here's, here's the gospel. Here's how the gospel should cha- transform the way that we see everything. If I'm a sinner, it's only been saved by the grace of Jesus. What am I deserved? What do I deserve? Nothing. Nothing. This is not entitlement. It's the opposite of that. We're not entitled to a thing. We're entitled to God's wrath. That's a hard message to say. That's what we're entitled to. We're entitled to punishment. Instead of getting all that, God says, I'm going to give you, I'll make you one of my sons and daughters, inherit everything out of my own good grace for you because I love you. When you wrap your mind around that, that changes the way you see other people. It has to. And so when we miss the gospel, we miss in, in dealing with people the way that we should and the way that we should see the world around us. I've, lots of preachers have heard say this. I don't know who said it originally or I quote them. But we should preach the gospel to ourselves daily. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Because when we hear the gospel, the gospel message, it's not just something you hear So like, oh yeah, I believe that now I'm saved. I've got this card that says I'm saved and now I can go living my life how I was always living it. We preach the gospel to ourselves daily to remind us of what Jesus did. We're about to take Lord's Supper in a little bit. Every time we do that, it's to be reminded of the gospel. It's to be reminded of what Christ did for us so that we continue to live for him. I come here on Sunday morning sometimes and and you know what, honestly, I go, it's been a rough week. And whatever it is, selfishness or self-pity or despair or whatever it may be and to be reminded of Christ and what he did for me that I'm not spending an eternity in hell but he's given me heaven he's given me grace he's given me goodness I mean this is what he's given me a future to look forward to it should change the way you live and see the world and we shouldn't be selfish in, our, in even the gospel proclamation going into why we share the gospel. is because we want other people to know the hope and the message of the truth of who Jesus is. It's why we go to Southeast Asia. It's why we plant churches all down, all around in Utah and all around the world. Because we want people to know Christ and be transformed by him just like we are. The gospel should be the lens in which we see everything. See our friendships, our marriage relationships, kids, neighbors, our, our way we treat our bosses, temp, 
talked a couple weeks ago about even just in our rooted relationships, the way that we go to work and you go to a job that you hate, and for many of you, that may be the case, right? Like, oh, I don't want to do this today. And you go to work. You, you, you live in such a way that glorifies God to your boss because you're thankful for what Christ has done for you. And you want to show him Jesus. The gospel is the lens so that we can boast in Jesus. And then lastly, the gospel is the bullseye. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God, with lofty speech or wisdom. Sometimes I think when we think of the gospel, and uh, especially in the proclaiming side of the gospel, we are to tell other people the gospel. Some of us may think, I can't share that message. I haven't been to school for that. Like, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I don't, God couldn't use me in that. Have you ever heard of the story of Charles Spurgeon? Anybody know who that guy is, Charles Spurgeon? Famous preacher, like in 1800s, 1900s time frame. Famous preacher. I mean, his, his influence worldwide. I mean, it's still today. We're still talking about him and some of the sermons he preached. And people look back at Charles Spurgeon and how, how great of a pastor he was. Well, you know the story of how he became a believer? He was trying to go to church one day, and it's a snowstorm. Snowstorm so bad, we're... He's like, where do I go? I can't go to the church I was going to go. So he goes and he tries to find just the first place he sees. It's this primitive Methodist chapel. I don't even know what that is exactly. But he, this is what he finds. He goes in, and it's like 10 people in a room. We've, had, we've probably had those Sundays at a church where it's like snowstorm, like nobody's here. Everybody's like, I'm staying home, not driving. Goes into one of these services. Gets in, and even the, the pastor who was supposed to be there that morning was, was, was caught up in the snowstorm. He couldn't even make it. So it's like he's kind of sitting there, and, you know, he's, he's hoping to find hope that morning. So he gets in and with the other 10 people, and I guess it kind of falls to one guy. He's like, I guess I'll do it. It's just a, a shoemaker, simple shoemaker. What he does for a living every day is he makes shoes, cobbler. He gets up, and he's like, okay, I'm just going to preach Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22, which says, I think he read it in the King James at the time, but, ESV says, turn to me and be saved at the, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. So, so his whole message is just like, and I think King James says, look upon God. And so his whole message was just, you need to look to Jesus. You need to look to Jesus. You need to look to Jesus. That's all he knew what to say. He didn't know anything else but other than, then you have to look upon Jesus. And he looks down at Spurgeon and goes, young man, you look very miserable. You need to look to Jesus. That was his message. That was it. You need to look to Jesus. And in that, Charles Spurgeon is convicted to his heart, to his core. The Holy Spirit uses this simple man's message to convict this man of his, his sin, his sinfulness, and his need for Jesus. Used him to share that message. Here's what Spurgeon had to say about him. I just want to quote this because it's awesome. Spurgeon's recounting this story. He says, I wanted to know how I might be saved. And if they could tell me that, I did not care how much they made my headache. The minister did not come that morning. He was snowed up, I suppose. At last, a very thin-looking man, a shoemaker, or tailor, or something of that sort, went up into the pulpit to preach. Now, it is well that preachers should be instructed, but this man was really stupid. I like his honesty in that. He's just like, he's just, he's just dumb. I don't know. He, didn't. he was obliged to stick to his text for the simple reason that he had little else to say. Now think about that story, and Paul says in here, Corinthians, verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, if all you have to say is, I know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified, you have everything to say. That simple, profound message is transformative. That message has, has gone around the world those in restricted nations who know nothing else but Jesus Christ and him crucified have been sharing that message and starting churches with that message and houses where if they get caught, they're going to jail. That message has changed the world, literally. I mean, you can even trace just all the, with the Gutenberg press and even the Protestant Reformation and all the Bible being shared in many, many languages. I mean, the, the, that message has transformed the world 
transform the world of that. I, I want to know nothing else except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Church, if we miss that, that gospel-centeredness, we miss the bullseye. We could have the most awesome programs in the world. Really, we could. We could have like a Disney World children's ministry. You could have a different pastor who's preaching, you know, up here on Sunday. You could have all the amazing things that you want. You know what? And think like, we've got it all. But if you don't have the gospel, you don't have anything. It's pointless. It's worthless. It's just refuse. It's just a social club for us to gather. The gospel is everything for us in that bullseye. If we don't hit that, we've missed the mark. It compels us to practice spiritual disciplines that our parents, that we be primary disciples of our kids at home, that we'd have healthy marriages. It's why we serve and we get up and we say, God, how can you use me and my gifts for your kingdom? That we have God-centered worship, genuine fellowship, selfless giving. We give because we want to glorify God. It's not ours to begin with. Spending more than seating, teachable people, bold evangelism, grace-filled relationships, the way that we forgive one another, the way that we see each other, that it's not about our own ego. But you know what? It's okay to admit you're wrong. It's okay to admit that I was wrong and say, we want to do this thing together because it's the right thing to do because of the sake of the gospel and church planning in tough places. Why do we go in tough places? Because nobody else is going. We want the gospel to be spread to the ends of the earth. So the question for you today is, one, do you know that message of the gospel? Do you know that message of the gospel? Is your life built on that foundation of the gospel? Or is it built on something that's false? And then two, as a church, will you pray with us that we be a church centered around the gospel? That it be the foundation of the temperature of our church as we do what we do, all for the sake of what Christ has done for us. Let's pray.